Good morning. Morning. Well, between what you heard earlier with the band and the free coffee, I can guarantee you there is no one in this room who's got a Super Bowl hangover at this point. <laughs> Those guys left about half an hour ago. All right, welcome, uh, and thanks for being with us here today. Um, I'd like to point out this, if you like, is the uh, live studio audience. We have many thousands of people that are following this event. Uh, we are broadcasting this live um, on EMC.com. Uh, along those lines, what I'd like to say, uh, those of you online, you will have a chance to interact uh, with us this morning. If you uh, have got questions for Pat Gelsinger, please feel free to tweet those questions on uh, the hash VFCash um, hashtag. Try saying that after a couple of drinks. Uh, but if you can tweet on that hashtag, then later on today we will have a chance uh, to ask Pat a few questions. Okay, so 12 months ago, what did we do? About this time last year, we had a big, what we called internally, mega launch. We announced 41 new products. We announced new products at the high end, we announced new products in the mid range, we announced new products at the low end. And over the last year, we've really taken share in every single segment. So we're pretty pleased with the way that went. Um, but we start this year really innovating along a new vector. Many of the products that we released about a year ago, they were refreshes of existing products. Uh, this year, we want to uh, kick off the year really talking about innovation in a new disruptive technology, obviously that disruptive technology uh, being Flash. And we hope that, you know, just like uh, it brought Cash Gordon back to life a second ago, we're hoping that for many of the applications in the data center, it'll bring those applications back to life as well. Now, Flash is already really dominating the consumer world. Okay, so the, the company that has been singularly responsible, I would say, for driving that in the consumer world um, is Apple. We're all beneficiaries of Flash technology, I'm sure, in the audience here today with their iPhones and iPads and, and everything else that we've got. Um, we hope to do a similar thing in the enterprise. And in fact, we believe that Flash will have a similarly profound effect in the enterprise. So over time, we actually feel like Flash is going to transform the look of the data center. Still very much a role for hard drives, but we think some of the high performance drives are clearly going to be replaced by Flash technology to deliver the kind of performance that those mission criti critical applications require. So EMC, we've been driving the adoption of Flash in the enterprise, and in fact, what I'd say at this point, if you look at the enterprise storage players, we probably ship more flash arrays and in future flash cards than the entire rest of the storage industry put together. And we feel that you know, we've, we've only just gotten started. Um, what you'll hear about today is a whole new wave of technology. Uh, you're going to hear a roadmap of new features, new capabilities that we're going to release uh, not just today, but over the next 12 to 18 months. So everything that you're going to see today is coming from our new Flash business unit. We have a number of folks from our Flash business unit with us here today. Um, we have an interesting model to drive innovation within EMC. We very much have a divisional structure, and we try to apply the same focus on specific areas of technology inside EMC that many pure plays would apply outside. And that allows us to compete. And I think EMC is one of the few big corporations that has been, to com been able to compete effectively with new innovative technologies amongst all of the pure plays that are out there. So singular focus of this unit to really drive the innovation and adoption of Flash. Now, with us today, we have um, a number of folks from EMC, um, most notably of which uh, we have Pat Gelsinger, who'll be up here in a second to talk you through the story. Uh, agenda today is pretty straightforward. Pat's going to come up here. Um, we're then going to split the room. There's a number of folks in the room who have one-on-one -on -one briefings. They're going to go behind the, the curtain, so to speak, and do those one-on-one -on -one briefings. And then Dan Cobb, who's the CTO from our Flash business unit, is going to come up here and give us all a deep dive on the technology. And I just want to reiterate one last time. We will do a Q&A session at the end of uh, uh, Pat's remarks. Uh, please uh, tweet on the VFCash hashtag if you would like to ask Pat a question over the next 45 minutes. So with that, let's get on with the show. Well, let's invite Pat onto stage. Pat.
Uh, thank you very much. I know you're disappointed that I'm not wearing the blue tights like uh, Flash Gordon. <laughs> but uh, it just wasn't in my attire this morning. So uh, let's dive right in here. And uh, since uh, uh, the Pentium Pro, right, which was really the beginning of the uh, standard high volume server, the Intel roadmap has just continued unabated to uh, deliver increasing server performance uh, capabilities as Moore's Law has scaled and then the advent of uh, multi-core uh, x86 CPUs, which you know, personally I participated in for almost 30 years, right, it's been this approximately doubling every two years or about 100x every uh, a decade, and that continues unabated uh, into the future. And against that, the I.O. capabilities have largely stagnated. And if you look in terms of uh, I.O.s per drive, since the 15K drive in 1998, right, sort of like nothing has happened. And this gap, right, has created this enormous I.O. gap that, uh, you know, has uh, throttled uh, performance capabilities of the overall data center, right, this lack of ability to keep up with those uh, multi-core x86 uh, CPUs. And against this, flash technology really provides a fundamental disruptive capability to step in and deal with that. When I first uh, started at uh, Intel in uh, 1979, I was really annoyed because we had the EEPROM guys in the lab right next to us. And uh, I was part of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, tail end of the business at that point, the money losing microprocessor business. And uh, the flash guy, or the EEPROM guys at the time, right, which is the precursor to flash, used to use UV light to uh, erase, uh, and they were making all the money. And uh, I was really annoyed because my bonus was nothing and they were making money, right, you know, I figured maybe I showed up in the wrong side of the lab. Turned out okay over time. And then uh, that led in uh, uh, 78 to the idea of a programmable, right, uh, of electronically programmable, and then Toshiba, right, uh, took that a step uh, further, resulting in eventually the core te technologies that today are represented by Flash. And as Jeremy indicated, the company in the consumer electronics industry who most adopted, grabbed, and took that uh, technology forward has been Apple, right, the iPod, and then iPad, and Air Mac, Right, all of those has really brought forward the disruptive capabilities of flash into consumer electronics. Against that, exactly what EMC is doing with respect to flash for enterprise and enterprise data centers. We were the first company in 2008 to bring forward the enterprise flash drive as really the first embodiment of a technology utilizing flash as a separate uh, disk uh, array technology. That was followed right, by uh, early adopters who started to utilize that technology. But at that point, it was still that you had to specifically provision it or take LUNs and specifically organize certain working sets on it. It wasn't a broad market technology. And that led to the second fundamental innovation, which was how can we bring flash technology for broad adoption across a wide range of enterprise uh, applications? And across that gap was fast technology and fast fully automated storage, storage tiering allowed a broad range of applications to take advantage of flash technology because essentially we said fast, fully automated storage tiering would take care of getting the right data to the right spot in that storage hierarchy. And thus with a very small amount of flash, you were able to actually boost the performance of the entire uh, arrays in very, very fundamental ways. Now, right, you know, as we look at this, our fast technology has allowed us to drive an explosive amount of flash uh, shipments. Last year, 24 petabytes of flash shipment. As Jeremy said, you know, we believe this is larger than the rest of the industry uh, combined. But what's even more powerful about FAST is that a small amount of flash, maybe one to 5% of the arrays, enables us to accelerate the whole array. And uh, last year, our FAST software technology was supporting over 1.3 exabytes of storage, right, utilizing right, just 24 uh, petabytes of uh, flash uh, shipments last year. And this shows the very powerful capabilities. Just a few percentage of flash right, enables the performance increment of very, very large arrays of storage. And this is why fast technology has been such an extraordinary value proposition uh, for our uh, customers. But what if we could even do much, much more? You know, what if we could say, let's do another order of magnitude improvement in performance? And that's exactly what VF Cache is about. Can't we make a step to see a dramatic improvement in I.O. rate, 
and in latency by moving to the other side of the wire. And you know, there have been right, you know, these dislocative steps of performance improvement. We saw hard disk drives, array flash, and now with VF cache, a 4,000x improvement versus the performance capability of spinning media, right, electromagnetic uh, drives. And this is exactly the gap and the opportunity that we see with VF cache today. Now, there are some early PCIe-based uh, flash products on this side of the chasm again. But much like the early uses of enterprise flash drives, they need to be specifically provisioned. They're, li they're islands of flash. The application environments and the operating system environments need to do all the management and the app awareness associated with those technologies. And fundamentally, it can't be a broad use case for many of the enterprise applications that exist today. And crossing that bridge is exactly what VF Cache is all about. It's enabling right, a broad utilization across essentially every application that data centers are taking advantage of today with management, with persistence, right, with integration, with support, with sales uh, capabilities, all those things that enterprise data centers expect. And that's exactly what VF Cache is about. EMC, clearly the number one storage provider for enterprise data center use cases today and against the, you know, the broad range of applications today, number one against each of these applications, right, and against each of these data center use cases. And this has afforded us great insights, great customer relationships, and great partnerships. And as we've begun engaging with those customers about how to continue innovating with flash technology, right, they've given us extraordinarily positive response to VF Cache and what we can do with this technology to further extend their applications with performance and latency improvements. VF Cache is built on three technology objectives that we have in mind. First, unparalleled performance. Second, intelligence. And third, protection. Performance, this 10x kind of improvement. Intelligence, extending the fast architecture technology not just within the arrays, but all the way through the storage hierarchy and all the way to the server. And protection, making it safe, making it integrated to the overall storage hierarchy, such that we're taking advantage of all the protection and data services that exist elsewhere in the data center. Let's start by looking at performance. EMC in this category is taking a multi-vendor approach, but our preferred partnership is with uh, Micron, and we have uh, Glenn and Greg here from Micron uh, today representing us, and the P320 card is the uh, prime launch vehicle for the uh, VF cache technology set. I'm sure all of you saw over the weekend the incredibly uh, sad news about uh, Steve uh, Appleton and CEO of uh, Micron, and uh, Steve was a personal friend for almost 20 years, and a uh, uh, really a powerful, right, aggressive, brazen leader of uh, Micron uh, Technologies. And you know, if you just join me just in a moment of silence just to respect uh, Steve and the great contributions that he brought forward to the industry today. The Micron Technology has truly been a great enabler for VF cache, and we're very excited with the performance capabilities that uh, the P320 card brings forward. And if you look at the specs for that, a 300 gigabyte drive using uh, SLC technology, uh, uh, best in class performance capabilities in terms of read, IOPS, uh, latency access, built on PCI Gen 2 by 8 technology, so extraordinary IO performance capabilities. And if we look at those as a direct comparison to the industry first with uh, Fusion IO's uh, product, you see our specs stand up very well. Simply put, it's not just that it's from EMC, this is the best technology in the industry as well to deliver server-side performance uh, capability. We're not just an innovator, we also have to consistently deliver the best products in the category, and unquestionably, VF Cache is that product today. And the results of that are some extraordinary improvements in uh, performance and looking at Oracle workloads, right, a 60% better response time, a critical factor in terms of uh, database uh, transaction responses, or total throughput of Oracle databases, uh, tripling, right, of the uh, throughput of the uh, databases. Looking at SQL Server, similar, 80% better response times, 
or throughput times of uh, you know, three and a half X improvements of throughput on SQL Server. Unquestionably, extraordinary gains in critical performance-centric uh, application categories. But VF Cache is an extension, right, of our storage hierarchy. And this data, right, shows the powerful complementary nature that VF Cache shows, by itself a huge performance gain. But it also shows the incremental performance when done in conjunction with Flash inside of the storage arrays. And in this sense, it's not one versus the other, but clearly and, or both, gives by far the best performance results overall. And again, you'll see over and over again this idea of extending the storage hierarchy, right, and making it a complement to building on those storage arrays very much gives the best of both worlds. One of our early customers, PPG, was a great example. They were one of our early uh, beta customers for VF Cache. They got very, very excited about the performance capability. And in fact, they held our VMAX uh, sales guys hostage because we weren't shipping the product yet. Right, and they said, the only way I'm gonna actually give you this PO is if in fact you bundle VF Cache with it. So somehow we were able to make an exception and find a way to include it in the PO even though it wasn't shipping yet. And you can see PPG, right, a large industrial uh, uh, firm, right, is a, a huge advocate of uh, the VF Cache uh, technology. Crazy fast IO, right, but done in conjunction with their industry standard data protection environments with the VMAX arrays. But it's not just performance, it's also intelligence. And FAST, fully automated storage tiering has been this idea that, hey, let's get the data in the right spot. If the data is performant, let's move it up to the FLASH tier. And if it's not performant, e.g. everything else, let's move it to a lower cost tier. And in this sense, we're giving our customers the best of both worlds. We're giving them cost savings or better performance. Hard to complain. And over time, we expect that increasingly it'll be right, you know, less and less fiber channel drives, less and less of these 15K drives, and increasingly utilizing lower cost or higher performant tiers. And that's the essence of FAST and why it's been very successful for us. Today, we extend FAST, right? And now we have this ultra performance tier, right, with uh, PCIe-based uh, Flash, right, which now gives us another alternative for the tiering technology to move it to ultra fast, fast, right, or the cost saving tier. And to us, that's very much this intelligence and we're building VF Cache as an extension to our fast uh, technologies. And this is where intelligence come in, the ability to get the data to the right spot where applications can most benefit from it. Customer Heritage Auction Gallery, the largest high value auction site uh, in the industry. And you can see, again, a huge excitement for VF Cache and the performance capabilities that it gives them on their application tier, but integrated to right, their persistence and data, uh, large uh, data storage environment they have as well. And in this sense, they're able to improve performance, don't have to do application rewrites, fits exactly into the database architecture that they were already using. A great early customer, heritage auction site. Performance intelligence, and finally, protection. VF Cache is architected as a right-through uh, product, and in that sense, it's taking advantage of all of the data services in the arrays, right, and doing so that it doesn't create this flash island somewhere in the data center that needs to be separately configured, managed, right, serviced. And in that sense, it's taking full advantage of the data arrays behind it while still giving the performance benefits of having a read cache on the server side performance without giving up protection in the broad set of da uh, data services that are available. We also come to the market with a broad set of server support. And ultimately, this is a server-side card. And while we have great experience in delivering server-side products with many, uh, with uh, millions of HBAs that we uh, deliver, install, and support for our customers today, it is a new product for us on the server side. And thus, we have Cisco, Dell, HP, and IBM right, certifying, and this represents by far the majority of the uh, server volume uh, today in the industry. And uh, in particular, right, Cisco is a great partner with us in this area. And uh, Satinder and uh, uh, oh, 
Paul, thank you, sorry, right, uh, uh, from Cisco here to join us for the uh, launch today. So uh, thank you both very much, a great partnership. Again, broad support by the uh, server industry and a great partnership with uh, Cisco, our partners in BCE and numerous other areas in the industry. So thank you very much to Cisco. This is V1 of VF Cache, and we have a rich roadmap of capabilities that we'll be delivering uh, over the next year. We will uh, increase the uh, performance, and one way we'll do that is by uh, server-side uh, dedupe uh, technology in our software stack. We'll also be delivering more intelligence, right? Enhanced array integration. We'll be taking these fast interfaces and being able to do prefetching, able to tag and hint between the storage array and the uh, server uh, side capabilities. We'll also, for multiple flashcards, have distributed cache coherency across multiple server cards. Uh, also, uh, deep integration into the VMAX and VNX management uh, suites and support suites as well. So making it an extension of the VMAX and VNX arrays. Also, extended uh, flash uh, options. We'll have different sizes of products. We'll have SLC and MLC versions of the products. Uh, we'll have uh, mezzanine cards as well as SSD uh, drives as well. So a whole range right, of form factor sizes and different configurations to cover a broader and broader set of use cases in the industry. So over the next year, a rich roadmap of VF cache technologies coming forward. But when lightning strikes, a few seconds later, there's always thunder. And I wanted to give a sneak peek of the thunder uh, technology that we'll be bringing forth uh, to the marketplace. And uh, Project Thunder is out to attack this question of you know, how do you scale PCIe server flash today? And in many cases, right, maybe a high density blade environment, you don't have the slots to put in the amount of flash you might want to put into the server environments. Right, you might also be in a situation where right, you have applications that you want to share that flash workload or share the workload across a set of uh, flash uh, resources. And against those two problems, specifically, is what Thunder is aiming uh, to address. And what Thunder is, is a server networked flash that allows us to combine the flash uh, uh, cards, the lightning cards, into a server network flash appliance. And there's, again, these use cases, high density uh, servers but don't have slots available. Maybe it's an Oracle rack environment where the working set is shared across a small number of servers. And that's specifically what uh, Thunder is off to deliver against, server network flashed right, for these shared configurations. And it also provides not just read, but also write caching uh, capabilities inside of the uh, server networked uh, flash appliance. So overall, right, a ne the next innovation in this space, in addition to the roadmap elements I just described, Thunder, and we'll be doing the first technology previews of this with our customers beginning uh, next quarter. So what you've seen is, is that we have storage architectures right, utilizing flash at every element right, of the data center, beginning inside of our arrays. And we've had great success. You know, high capacity hard disk drives, and while hard disk drives haven't kept up in performance, their aerial density improvements continue to make them unquestionably the cost per bit winners. Right? They are the place that data will be stored in high volume. But to complement that array flash, and that's what our you know, beginning in 2008 has been extraordinarily successful for us, and EMC is seen as a leader in both technology as well as in volume in that category. Server PCIe flash, today's VF cache announcement, right? again, bringing flash innovations to the data center in new and powerful ways. And finally, the first glimpse at Project uh, uh, Thunder. Right, and with Thunder bringing the server networked flash capabilities right, into a shareable right, uh, server side network uh, configuration. So overall, unquestionably, EMC as the leader in enterprise flash technology for every layer right, of the data center and for every class of application. You know, in summary, first to market with EMC right, with uh, flash uh, technology in the array with fast technologies. Today, very excited to bring forward the VF cache technology. 
a breakthrough capability for the industry and for our customers. And finally, a first glimpse at Project Thunder, a server network flash, which will have our first customer engagements beginning in Q2 of this year. And with that, thank you very much, and I think we have some time for Q&As. I'm gonna wait for the music to finish. Okay, so Q&A, um, obviously if you're in the physical world, that would be all of you. Good old fashioned, put your hand up, that will work fine. Um, just wanna remind folks that are following this online, if you tweet your question on VFK, hash VFCash, uh, we will endeavor to get your question answered as well. Pat clearly can't answer every question that's coming through, uh, but we will uh, get the team on it and make sure that we answer all the questions that are up online as well. So with that, anybody uh, would like to ask Pat a question? I have a microphone, so if you just give me a minute, I will uh, be able to run around and do my duty. Right here. Hi, curious, uh, what's the pricing for VF Cash? Uh, VF Cash, um, it will be competitive, right? If you look, uh, Fusion IO is the category leader. We're gonna be competitive versus their pricing. Right, and uh, you know, let's say at a modest discount to where they are in the marketplace as we bring it forward. So we'll be price competitive. Hi, um, when do you expect uh, Project Thunder products to come to market? Derivatives. When, when do we expect Thunder products to come to market? Right, we'll begin customer engagements in Q2, and today we're not announcing a GA date for them yet. So, you know, customer engagements will start in Q2, and uh, you know, we'll be uh, you know, bringing them broadly available somewhat after we go through some of the customer and uh, uh, beta processes with customers, but not announcing a GA date yet for them today. This year, you know, nominally everything I'm talking about is within the next year, right, or we wouldn't be talking about it, but again, we're not trying to be too specific with an announcement date quite yet. You know, we did our first preview of Lightning at EMC World last year, Right, so May of last year is when we gave our first preview of uh, Lightning. So, right, if history is any guide. Pat, we, we have a, a question online. Um, is the disk drive dead? Isn't an all flash array the, array the way to go? Is the disk drive dead? Well, when I, I like, uh, as an old semiconductor guy, I always look at things as uh, against the Moore's Law. So it doubles every two years. And how does storage do, how does compute do, how does networking do, the big three versus that. And basically networking is way sub Moore's law. You know, computing is approximately Moore's law. And data density is super Moore's law. So we're seeing data increase faster than Moore's law uh, going forward. And we expect that to sustain over time. And you know, EMC did a study last year, a 44x improvement or increase in data storage right uh, before uh, 2020. So we continue to see the storage volume continue to explode. Against that, right, you know, the hard disk drive today is anywhere from 30 to 50x less expensive per bit. So if you look at it down to the bit level, and that's an extraordinary cost gap. So there's no way, no way, right, that flash can possibly, right, fill that gap. In fact, I've seen some studies saying if we just wanted to do that, it'd be something over $100 billion of incremental flash fabs would be required tomorrow, right, to go satisfy that demand. Not gonna happen, right? Right, great. So we see that flash will always be a complement to hard disk drives going forward. And performance goes to flash, right? Large, persistent store will always be on hard drive. And if you look at aerial densities, if anything, the hard drive industry is outpacing in terms of the price per bit, the cost per bit of flash technologies. So we see it really as tiering, as those two technologies working in combination for decades to come. We just don't see any change to that in the future. So I guess that was a long answer to simply say no, right? The disk drive is far from dead, right? The one drive, you know, we do see that high performance drives could be dead in the future because performance will move to flash, but volume drives will be the mainstay of high volume storage for decades to come. Okay. What's the go-to-market plan for the, this solution and potentially the future Thunder solution? Are you OEMing through the server vendors or are you gonna sell through your direct sales force? Uh, we will uh, sell uh, primarily through channels as well as through our direct sales force. We'll be doing both of those. 
We don't have any OEM agreements that we're announcing today, right? But, you know, those are possible as well in the future. But two prime areas, channel sales and EMC's uh, large direct sales force into the enterprise. Hi, Pat. A uh, couple here. questions. One, first, uh, class act to moment of silence for Micron. Can you talk about the Micron ro role and relationship and also talk about co uh, coopetition with the server vendors in Dell and HP in particular and IBM who are competing with Stuart U on storage? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, first, uh, you know, Micron, uh, uh, we are truly delighted with our partnership with Micron. And, you know, I, I definitely, uh, you know, was just as shocked as anybody uh, seeing the news uh, over the weekend. And we have worked very closely with Micron as our preferred hardware uh, partner for bringing this forward. So working through the software stack, the drivers, all those type of things, the details of the hardware that they're doing. And it simply is a better hardware card today. I showed you some of the specs, the way the control functions are, right? It utilizes hardware-based control capabilities, so less load on the CPU. So just a number of performance characteristics, the Gen 2, right, by 8 characteristics, the way the controller's done. It's just the best-in-class product today. So we're very excited to be working with them, right? It is a multi-vendor hardware approach strategy on the EMC side. You might have seen some of the LSI comments. We expect that we'll be uh, using them as well. Uh, so we expect that we will always be taking the best hardware uh, technology. We'll be working closely with Micron to hopefully have them always being the best uh, as we uh, go forward. But we do have a multi-hardware uh, approach as our uh, strategy overall, just like we've done in the disk drive uh, industry. And I think I forgot the second half of your question. Oh, yes. The yeah. And, you know, fundamentally, this is a PCIe card. Right, you know, it's our software that we go in the stack, and you know, just like we deliver, you know, literally millions of HBA cards today that go into lots of people's servers. Right, this is sort of just another card that goes into the servers, and it's a very standard business practice for HP, IBM, Dell, Cisco to have a broad range of cards that are certified for their uh, servers, and I showed you the data here. Right, we're not in the server business. Right, you know, we are right extending the storage array into the server side. Right, we're participating in the I.O. stack of the server. We're not going into the servers. Right, we have Cisco as partners and obviously HP, IBM, Dell, and you can expect that we'll have others going uh, forward. So from our perspective, this is truly cooperation. We're not competing with them, so there is no co coopetition uh, in that regard. We're very much complementing the server capabilities of each of those partners. Another question online. Um, does VF Cash complement VPlex or work around it? Does VF Cash complement VPlex or work around it? Well, VF Cash could sit in front of, right, uh, sits on the server side of the I.O. stack. So essentially, right, it is before the, v, the VPlex layer, right, in the uh, I.O. hierarchy. So in that sense, it complements it. It would work with it. It could cache workloads that would go through a VPlex into some distributed storage environment over distance, the unique capabilities of VPlex. So it's clearly complementing what VPlex does. At this point, we haven't done any unique integration, right, of VF cache and VPlex, and you can certainly expect that we will do those type of things in the future. Question at the back. Pat, could you uh, talk a little bit about how you see PowerPath being a competitive differentiator here around VF Cache and what you think that means to the future of VF Cache when it comes to unified storage? Yeah, so PowerPath is a great uh, you know, footprint for us on the server side and the fact we leverage some of the PowerPath technologies in the building of the uh, I.O. stack for uh, VF Cache. So given that uh, the PowerPath architecture is just another uh, opportunity for us to leverage in the I.O. stack, right? We are utilizing some of the technology, right, in this first product that we're bringing forward. We expect to do that uh, even further uh, as we go forward with uh, PowerPath. And obviously, it's just another aspect, just like I answered with the, you know, the complement to the server side, given the, and the uh, leverage that we have from the large presence of HBA presence that we have. PowerPath is another point. Right, we're already doing a lot of server-side software integration with PowerPath. So again, it's just as another aspect of the safety, security, the momentum we already have in delivering server-side software uh, stacks. Uh, this is David Floyer from Wikibon. 
Uh, what uh, operating system environments are supported by VF Cache? Uh, we've uh, certified it on Windows, uh, on VMware, on uh, Red Hat Linux. Uh, any others? Uh, oh, hi, yeah, Windows Hyper-V. So, you know, Win, uh, Win Server as well as Hyper-V, uh, VMware, uh, and uh, Red Hat Linux at this point. And over time, we'll continue to expand that uh, list. You'll also see us doing more work uh, uh, with VMware and uh, Hyper-V in terms of deeper integration uh, with respect to the uh, virtualization environment. We think there's some very clever uh, optimizations that can be further done inside of the virtualization environment as well. One more on, online here. Um, is uh, Project Thunder a server? Will it be able to run server workloads? Uh, Project Thunder will certainly have uh, some CPUs in it, right? Obviously, to run the management stack, et cetera. But its purpose is to really be seen as an I.O. Uh, appliance uh, in that sense. So we're not intending it to ever run right, virtualized servers, uh, workloads, we're not expecting to expose ESX hosts or anything like that in it. It is very much a server network flash appliance that's simply optimizing a large set of flash resources. And some of these, you know, I mean, we're gonna be putting terabytes of flash in this uh, server network flash uh, thunder uh, appliance. So it's not intended to run any compute workloads, it's fully intended to be optimizing the, uh, IO the shared I.O. performance that's possible from a large array of flash. Uh, <clears throat> I just have one quick question. Is, is this a protocol agnostic SAN solution or is it dependent on um, the, the type of SANs that are deployed? Uh, so remember, it's server side. Right, so in that sense, it's not seen on the SAN side at all. It's on the server side network. Uh, I'm sorry, is your question on Lightning or on Thunder? Uh, Lightning it is. Okay, so Lightning sits, essentially it's seen as an iSCSI accelerator, right, you know, is how, is how it looks on the server side. Uh, pardon? But so, but agnostic at that level. And uh, Danny will be up here shortly. You can ask, you know, he'll give a, a bit more details uh, on that. Uh, Thunder, right, as appliance, we expect it's a high performance server side device, so it'll be 40 gig or InfiniBand or, you know, how we expect Thunder to be seen uh, as a high performance, low latency uh, uh, server network flash device, very, you know, with uh, very minimal overheads into that shared array. Customers putting flash inside their servers, would, th would there still be a need for flash and storage systems or will there be less petabytes of flash uh, shipped in a VMAX and VNX? Uh -huh. And that's exactly, you know, if you look at that one graph and maybe I didn't explain it as well as I should have, right, you know, what we showed was sort of 1x, right, with uh, just disk drives. It was like 3x, right, with uh, VF cache. And it was like 5x with uh, flash in the, right, array. And it was like 8x, with flash and VF cache. And in that sense, we see it as highly complementary workloads. Different workloads will vary. You know, a smaller working set, clearly VF cache will work much better, right, in that regard. If it's a, an extremely large working set, then you're gonna want much more of the array side benefits. So it's the complementary uh, amount, right, we see as being high across many workloads, but the better configuration of more server versus more in the array side will clearly depend on the characteristics of the workload uh, that's being accelerated. But we fundamentally see it as complementary. We don't think one replaces the other. And part of the power of the VF cache and the fast technique is we're gonna have this hinting going back and forth between the array and between Lightning. So Lightning will be telling the array, I'm caching this, you don't have to, right? Or the array can be pre-caching things uh, that are seen as being uh, hot or soon to be hot uh, as well, and bringing them up to the VF cache tier as well. So that's the intelligence we expect to put across the array and into the VF cache uh, capabilities on the server side, is that ongoing optimization capabilities. But on the workloads that we've tested so far, right, we've seen it really being additive, not one replacing the other, uh, at least all the testing that we've done to date. I'm sure there's gonna be some very, you know, vagrant workloads that it's one versus the other, but everything that we've tested so far is it really enhances the performance by having both. Okay, probably call it a day okay. there. Okay, 
All right, so thanks to Pat. Thank you. Okay, and as I said, there are many more questions. There's a few technical questions. Uh, you know, Pat, Pat will be mortified that you know I didn't ask him all the technical questions that are online because I know he likes to you know, take a run at uh, anything and everything. Uh, but I've noticed that uh, Chad Sakach, our virtual geek, is already online answering questions. And we'll make sure that um, all of the questions that are asked online uh, will provide an answer to as well. OK, so what we're going to do now, the, the, the folks in the room who have one-on-one -on -one briefings are going to migrate behind the curtain for those briefings. Um, the rest of the folks are going to remain here, because certainly as the questions online have gotten a bit more technical, then it seems to me that we want to do a bit more of a deep dive um, into the product. And so what I'd like to do now is invite Dan Cobb onto stage, who is the CTO of our Flash business unit. Dan. Flash. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to the physical and virtual audience out there. We're going to take a little bit of time and go through um, uh, following up on the, the sort of what uh, about VF Cash, a little bit into the how and why, why you should care, what's important about it. And for some people who might not have been paying attention in Computer Science 101, a little bit of caching theory, a little bit of how impact of uh, low latency, high throughput devices can really have a significant impact on, um, on real world applications. So, uh, you know, Pat described for you uh, VF Cache, and really this, the design mantra, if you will, of the team was, how can we deliver high performance for real world applications? How can we deal with the intelligent IO path between server and storage and provide that as an integrated service that delivers enterprise capabilities? And how can we give uh, customers the, uh, the ability to leverage and extend the capabilities of high availability, of uh, snapshots, of data services, of replication, of quality of service, of SLAs in their storage platforms that they've built so much of their, uh, uh, so much of their workflows and so much of their IT structure around. So we're going to dig into a little bit more of that today in this session and uh, maybe get a little more technical and certainly cover a couple more topics. So the backdrop of what's been happening in the flash, and you, you saw Pat refer to uh, the, uh, the Apple uh, situation and what's happening with people taking the fundamental NAND that uh, folks like our friends at Micron have, have, have been building for a long time and innovating around and turning that into IT value. In the past um, five, six, seven years, venture capital funding for turning NAND into IT value has exceeded a billion dollars, right? So there's a lot of money been spent into there, and the, you know, the joke back at the office is um, while we're doing a presentation or a briefing, another flash startup might have come out of stealth during that meeting. So uh, a lot of activity, really exciting time to be in this space. Um, but so that billion dollars is now turning into IT value as delivered from, uh, from our friends at the, at, at the smaller companies. And uh, they like to position themselves as moving fast, as, uh, as being aggressive, as really being the only ones who get this cool technology and everything else. And I just thought it makes sense to put this into context a little bit, right? Um, 2008, EMC delivered enterprise flash drives, right? Well, 2005, we started looking at enterprise flash drives. And essentially, to sort of paraphrase Thomas Edison, we taught the flash guys a thousand ways not to make an enterprise flash drive. All those learnings, all that capability, all that understanding translated itself into being able to ship Enterprise Flash in 2008, followed up by significant software investments coming forward to deliver fully automated storage tiering. Fully automated storage tiering caching functionality came next. All Flash configurations last year, and this year VF Cache. So um, I don't think EMC has to take a backseat to any of the startups or any of the venture guys out there. Because I think our investments probably, in, uh, you know, taken, taken in total, exceed what other folks in the industry, venture or otherwise, have invested in leveraging this particular technology for IT value. If you then polish your crystal ball a little bit, uh, a lot of our friends who forecast where all this technology is going to end up really give you a, a, an eye into uh, kind of two major categories where, where Flash gets deployed. The orange here being flash as deployed um, in a storage platform. It might be a two and a half inch electromechanically compatible device that slides transparently into a slot. Software stack doesn't change, nothing has to notice, but suddenly your device has gotten, uh, gotten much faster and uh, enabled much higher throughput. 
Other people might say the right place to put it is in the server. So you see you know, server as a, uh, a significant deployment option for people going forward. If you look at these things though and you say, hmm, if I'm only about Flash in the server, then I have the kind of data protection and operational challenges that, um, uh, that, that result in you know, stranded capacity and, uh, and, and the types of things that uh, when the data is only as available as the server is available. Uh, if I only put Flash in the array, um, then I get the benefits of Flash, and we've seen a lot of significant benefits there in terms of delivering IOPS to real world applications, but the distance of that Flash from the processor, it limits the, number, the amount of uh, performance gains I can actually get. So no doubt you can see that there's, a, there's an in-between answer here, right? There's a way to build these technologies together such that you, you're deploying Flash across the ecosystem so you have the right data in the right place at the right time, no excuses on performance, and no compromises on data services or, or data protection. Um, if you're one of the orange guys or you're one of the yellow guys, you might look at this and say, well, I'm, my customers are storage administrators or my customers are server administrators. And uh, you know, there's, they, they talk about this as if the, though it's open warfare between server admins and storage admins and things like that. And I'll tell you, the, the great thing about my job is I get to talk to a lot of people in the IT world. I get to talk to a lot of CIOs and, and, uh, and, and IT staff folks. And uh, they don't want open warfare between server and storage. What they want is an intelligent ecosystem that delivers real value to their lines of business. They don't want people fighting over turf, fighting over budget, fighting over ownership of, uh, of who gets to deploy the latest cool things. They just want this problem solved with technologies that, that uh, provide the right return on investment and satisfy the needs of real business problems and real applications that they have today. So this pitting one against the other um, is probably the wrong thing technologically, but it's certainly the wrong thing uh, in terms of uh, organization. So we're gonna take a little bit of a look into the VF cache architecture and show you a little bit of block diagrams and, uh, and, and some of the pieces here. And so I'll, I'll set a little bit of a backdrop for that. Um, you know, one of the questions that came up recently was about PowerPath and sort of the role in PowerPath. And uh, if taking a step back, um, one of the things that you need in a caching solution in the I.O. stack is a very lightweight I.O. inspection technology. And what we were able to do is leverage literally thousands of developer years of being in every single enterprise kernel I.O. stack. Uh, and and uh, the, the care and the, and the optimization that happens when you're, when you're in the I.O. stack on every enterprise operating system, on every enterprise platform, capture those learnings, capture some of that intellectual property, and turn that into this lightweight I.O. inspection layer that was inspired in a, in a large set by the, uh, by the PowerPath team. Combine that with what really is EMC's bread and butter DNA. Right? EMC knows caching. EMC has analyzed millions of workloads, billions of I.O.s, Right? And, and, and in that analysis, as understands access patterns, understands sizes, understands the impact of various uh, caching uh, 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 characteristics and algorithms that might, be, uh, that might be employed in this thing. And our ability to take that DNA, to marry it with the, uh, uh, the power path uh, experience there, really gives us a way to leverage some key EMC resources in then building VF cache. The last part of EF Cache then is this advantaged hardware platform. Um, you know, we really talk about the, the need of, once we have the software pieces done, the need to have a hardware platform that's optimized for throughput, high throughput, optimized for latency, very low latency, and highly efficient. Um, it shouldn't require you to spend you know, 10, 20, 30% of, um, of your application CPU time just doing you know, error correction and wear leveling and, and those kinds of things for flash devices, you ought to be able to actually use your server for real world applications. And so we'll talk a little bit more about each of these going forward. So the architecture then for, for Lightning, um, for Lightning, see I still want to call it Lightning, for VF cache is, um, is embodied in this picture. And I, I dare say this is probably one of the few pictures you'd ever see from EMC where the server box is bigger than the storage box. 
Uh, why? Well, because most of the components that VF Cache manages and we're giving some insight into today belong in that, um, in that server box. So obviously the most important thing here is the application. Real world applications, real world um, workflows, uh, real world business processes and things like that running on today's servers. The VF Cache driver then has this inspection te technology and this cache management technology that manages what data is stored on the PCIe flash, right? transparently passes I.O. requests back and forth to the storage array with no additional overhead, and sits in there and, and, and in a sense manages which data can be rapidly returned to the application and which data needs to be passed through to the array, and we'll tackle kind of three important um, uh, use cases for, for this stack. So uh, if you're familiar with caching, you'll, uh, you'll hear the caching people talk about cache hits and cache misses and cache fills. A cache hit is when the data you need is in the cache and you get it back very quickly. A cache miss is when it's not in the cache and you've got to go get it somewhere else. And a cache fill is, hey, I just had a request for some data that I didn't have. Maybe I ought to put it into my cache so it's available there next time. We'll talk about all three of those. So in this case, an application issues a read. Application is totally unchanged, doesn't even know VF cache is there. The beauty of VF cache is it's tra transparent to the application and transparent to the underlying storage. VF cache driver takes a look inside the cache, decides, hey, I have this block, and very rapidly returns it to the application in microseconds, not in milliseconds. So this is where the performance acceleration comes by getting very low latency, very high throughput read responses from cache hits. Sometimes the data's not in the cache. We call that a read miss. Same thing happens. Application issues a read. VF cache driver takes a look, says, I don't have the data. I've got to go back out to the storage array to get it. Goes to the storage array, comes back to the application. Again, no additional time delay, no additional um, uh, um, uh, hops introduced in, in any of this. The same I.O. request that would have gone out to the server without VF cache present. And then in the background, that data that was provided to the application is copied into VF Cache so that the next time it's needed, it's there and it's able to, to be responded, to be able to respond to the application very, very quickly. So that's kind of the cache miss case. The other piece to this then is what happens when the application issues a write. And as you might have guessed right now, the write comes through. Read caches don't accelerate write, so VF cache really isn't involved in the write path here. That's why Pat called it a write through cache. Right. That data is then fetched from the storage array and passed back up to the application. So again, minimizing uh, latency as perceived by the application issuing, uh, issuing a write. So that write is acknowledged immediately when the data is safe and protected on the storage array. Then in the background, just like on the read miss example, we copy the data into the PCIe flashcard so that it's available for those, those uh, application scenarios where I immediately come back and read the data after I've written it. And th those are fairly common in a database world. So um, the design principles that we talked about for the hardware environment then um, uh, really kind of transcend a lot of what we, uh, what we did in software and they also apply to um, uh, to hardware, and I want to really take my hat off to the um, to the Micron team for partnering so closely with us as we've um, focused on you know on throughput, on um, latency, and on efficiency um, of this stack. What you see here in the um, uh, in the column on your left, really, it represents throughput. How many IOs can I get in and out of the hardware device per second in real-world application scenarios? Applications issue. 10, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256 IOs at a time. So being able to have a highly parallel data path, right, delivers two to three times more IOPS than the most popular solution um, in the marketplace right now. And those IOPS directly translate to better application throughput. Having the IOPS is one part of the story. Being able to deliver two to three times as many IOPS with only one third the latency is the second part of this. So while, that app, uh, while those, um, those IOPS are being delivered, in this case, you know, over 200,000 8K IOPS, right, they're being delivered with very low latency compared to the, um, 
uh, compared to the competitive offering. One third the latency. So three times as many IOPS at one third the latency. That translates directly into improved application response. Right? Um, and we, what we see is uh, this type of response when, the, when uh, applications are very busy, when there's a lot of I.O. happening in parallel, really has a net impact on um, uh, elevating the performance levels of, uh, of the application, of reads and writes. Lastly, then, is this, uh, I hit the button too fast and they told me I can't go backwards, but lastly is that CPU impact one. Um, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the whole notion of being able to run the flash management stack um, off system on, on an intelligent PCIe card, the ability to do, um, uh, you know, wear leveling, uh, flash management, uh, uh, translation, essentially, you know, log-based uh, flash uh, uh, I.O. activities, um, error correction, and um, uh, elimination of errors by, uh, by re extra redundancy um, in the flash card. All that is happening off-board. All that is happening in the uh, PCIe flash card. And so what you see is, while delivering three times as many IOPS, while delivering each of those at one-third the latency, the CPU impact is really negligible compared to the, uh, the, the popular co competitive card that's out there right now. So you end up being able to do more work um, quickly, more quickly with less impact on the, on the server. And frankly, you bought your server and you bought all those cores to run your application, not to run your storage stack. So very, very... Uh, uh, hard focus on this, these particular architectural tenets, and they also will apply to, uh, to Thunder when we start looking, uh, looking forward to that as, um, as Pat previewed. So I call this one kind of once upon a workload. You've talked about the stack, you've talked about efficiency, and you've talked about latency and everything else. At the end of the day, if you're talking to someone who's looking at an application and looking how it, how it gets its data um, from a file system, from a set of volumes, from storage, You'll hear them talk all day long about the trade-off between achieving low latency and, ach and achieving high throughput. And if you, if you just take a step back and say, well, the best way to achieve the lowest possible latency is to do the least amount of work. Just give it one I.O. and get it in and out of the system really fast, and that's the lowest possible latency you can get. Well, that's great for one, one I.O., but what about all the other I.O.s the application wants to issue? So you start issuing mo multiple I.O.s, two, four, eight, 16, et cetera, and you notice that your throughput is going up, 32 IOs, it's very, still fairly low latency and, um, and much higher throughput. At some point in just about any system, and this is just here for example that we ran into this wall at 64, you, know, you notice that you really have run out of system capacity, you've really run out of the system's ability to do more work in parallel, and so eventually all these IOs that are coming in stack up and you start to increase latency and not get um, significant increases in, in throughput anymore. This type of behavior is canonical. This type of behavior exists on every storage platform, on every workload, on every device. So you can just start looking at these kinds of things and saying, you know, well, where is my curve, right? How, how do I trade off between latency and throughput? Why did I spend, you know, 35 seconds of your valuable time in uh, this room's oxygen discussing this? Well, because the VF cache benefit then, the VF cache effect is to move that entire workload down and to the right. Right? with no changes to the application, no changes to the backend storage platform to achieve significantly lower latency and significantly higher throughput through this uh, intelligent application of server-side flash. Okay? So now let's look at what happens in the real world. Um, on this side, we're looking at a, um, uh, a TPCC-like application uh, and a kind of a before and after VF cache. Right? So this brownish line is uh, the baseline. This is basically the system running the same workload without VF cache. So workload starts, time goes on left to right here, and the, X or the Y axis is really how long does each transaction take inside the database layer? What's the average transaction latency? And you can see here in this case it's uh, you know, 100 milliseconds. And that's pretty standard all the way across uh, this particular workload. So now the workload, you know, now we're at an hour and 40, an hour and 50, and the workload kind of runs for, um, uh, for upwards of uh, two and a half hours. Right. The pink line, though, is same application, same storage, same computer, same everything else. Now turn VF cache on. 
at the beginning, there's not a lot of data in the cache, so we're getting a lot of cache misses. Maybe they're read misses, maybe they're write misses, as we talked about earlier. But as the cache fills, we start getting more and more cache hits. And these are the cache hits that are taking microseconds, not milliseconds, you'll recall. And the more full the cache gets, the better the benefit of this is to reducing latency. So we've moved from you know, 100 uh, milliseconds to 60 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds to sometimes 40 milliseconds of latency. This is that 60% improvement in application perceived latency that really is the impact of, um, of VF cache for real world applications. The other way to look at that is I can get more work done in the system. So I can get, if the baseline for the same workload is, um, is 1.0, think of that as transactions per minute as delivered to the application as perceived by the application. With VF cache, I can get 3.1 times the same amount of work through the system, tripling the amount of work through the system, having the latency of each piece of work. So pretty significant application gains. So VF cache uh, is one of these solutions, and I think this is true of, uh, of any read cache solution, that really adds significant value, but it adds significant value in, the, in, in places that are amenable to, um, to read caching. There's no black art here, there's no special science. Um, what you need to understand, a couple of things. You need to understand locality or working set in caching terms. What that means to storage people is, do I have the type of application where 100% of the IOPS are on 100% of the data? I'm reading an entire data set, or I'm writing an entire data set, or I'm doing a backup, or my IO is just totally randomly across uh, you know, all gigabytes or terabytes in the system. If so, we'd say you're in this category, right? This lower, uh, lower left category. What we learned with FAST and, uh, and, and our tiering strategy was, well, oftentimes, in fact, most of the workloads, 80% of the IOPS are on 20% of the data, or 90-10, or 95-5, or 70-30. That type of IO pattern means you do have some locality, you do have a working set, and it's, that type of workload is amenable to a caching solution. The other thing that's, uh, that you go into when you look at your workloads for is, um, is, are these workloads mostly read or mostly write, right? Write mostly workloads, maybe log files and, and, uh, and journals and those kinds of things. Well, if most of the time I'm writing, the benefits of a read cache to me are kind of negligible. So, um, you know, wouldn't slow anything down, but it certainly wouldn't speed anything up. Fortunately for us, most IO, uh, most workloads in a data center are read mostly, 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, and odd up. So if you have read mostly workloads with well-defined working sets, they're excellent fits for VF cache. And this represents the vast majority of workloads in an average data center today. So real world applications, real world IOs, four kilobyte IOs, eight kilobyte IOs, 16 kilobyte IOs, today's OLTP systems, email systems, and things like that, all great candidates for VF cache. Um, question, there was a question earlier about VMware and VMware support. I thought it would make sense to share an architectural view of how VF cache functions in, um, in VMware. So the blue box here is essentially the server again, and the server is running ESX or ESXi. So you've got the ESXi storage stack, you've kind of got their vSCSI layer and VMFS, and drivers and things for network devices and HBAs and things like that. Well, the uh, VF cache hardware card gets installed into the box, and a native ESX driver um, is installed to control that card. Right? Inside of each guest, Linux or Windows, running the same applications that were being run before, using the same you know, system services as before, the VF cache filter driver is inserted, the same exact filter driver that, uh, that we saw on the earlier diagram. That gets inserted into the I.O. stack, is doing the uh, lightweight inspection, is doing the cache management, and transparently sits inside of each VM, so I can cache an individual VM, I can cache a group of VMs, I can give one VM more cache um, than another, and I can start to manage applications in a virtualized world against service levels and against the sharing that's inherent in, um, uh, in, a, in a VMware or vSphere-like architecture. The control path for these things pull all the information up into vCenter. So a vCenter plugin 
the same vCenter plugin technology that we use with our VNX and VMAX and, um, and Isilon products and things like that, um, all come up into a vCenter plugin and you can do cache management and control monitoring of the virtual world in the same plugin that you do hardware monitoring and events and things like that in the physical world all pulled together into one consistent user experience. So Pat did a little bit of previewing. Um, I wanted to say stole my thunder, but that's a bad pun for this particular thing. Um, as we, we talk about uh, what we're doing going forward. I think the high points of what I'd like to, like to mention though is the leverage that VF Cache has by being able to um, uh, apply and refine and reuse and leverage uh, EMC's uh, incredible history of innovation. We talked about the PowerPath stack and some of the things that we were able to take there for this lightweight inspection technology. We talked about caching and how the caching DNA and the analysis of, of data uh, access patterns uh, significantly impacted how we, we, uh, we address caching in, um, in, in VF Cache. The IP that comes from data domain and Avamar and things like that for, uh, for deduplication and high speed compression will help us deliver larger effective cache sizes uh, for, um, for future versions. Uh, the ability to engage in um, uh, deeper uh, metadata sharing with, uh, with storage arrays, the ability to pass, pass hints and tags back and forth about what information should be cached, what information is being cached up here. You can imagine that if VF cache is holding a bunch of information, there may not be any reason for the array to hold it in its cache um, for any longer than necessary. So we expect that through this uh, deepening integration, some of which exists today, some of which is, uh, is, is coming in the future, this integration really allows the most efficient use of both array and VF cache resources uh, going forward. Um, the ability to do uh, cache coherency with technology, again, that's leveraged from what we do in VPlex. Uh, the ability to do management integration so that when an administrator sits down and is used to managing a set of LUNs on their storage platform, they can double click on a LUN and see the VF cache statistics, understand the overall performance of VF, what VF cache is doing in the server and the impact of the uh, technologies on the storage array and get an end to end view of a single holistic IO stack um, in there as opposed to having to go out and chase component by component by component. That operational benefit is huge. No one wants to go log into multiple servers to query multiple things and then bring them all together uh, in, into a meeting. In fact, you, you'd have to bring six or seven people into the room just to look at an operational issue. With this kind of management integration, you'll be able to start looking at you know, the storage path itself and the LUN itself and then the, the related technologies that apply to it. And then, uh, you know, Pat mentioned the need for more form factors, making this more consumable, um, new technologies or other, other technologies for deployment like um, SSD form factors, like larger cards, like use of MLC technology, like mezzanine cards for, um, for blades, uh, for blade servers and things like that. So you continue to see this, the hardware part of VF Cache evolve into a family of related offerings uh, that, uh, that will apply at all levels of the, of the IT ecosystem. And so now we get into um, you know, something completely different, uh, Project, Project Thunder. Um, one of the most important things I'd, I'd say about Project Thunder is uh, it is being designed you know, by, with, and for our, some of our leading edge customers. It's a highly participative design process where we have essentially adopted some leading edge customers who basically are looking for the best in class uh, capabilities that I described earlier. Best in class throughput, best in class uh, latency characteristics, and best in class efficiency. I offload the, uh, the host CPU and let it run the application while the rest of the ecosystem does its job to, uh, to manage high speed, low latency storage. So, Think about Thunder as the performance of PCIe Flash and the advances that are being led there through Moore's Law. Incremental units of server Flash deployed in order to fill uh, an appliance, you know, so scale up within a box, scale out between boxes, 
attached to a server network, attached to high-speed um, you know, FDR and Finiband or 40 gigabit Ethernet uh, and beyond. Attaching them to the network brings in the power of Metcalf's law. Now they're there, multiple servers can see them, multiple servers can access them. Uh, scale out workloads, uh, clusters, and those kinds of, uh, of technologies. The agility of, of workload mobility, being able to v-motion workloads from server to server to server and still maintain the uh, data footprint on very high speed flash uh, footprint. And uh, you know, it's the perfect complement to blade systems. The blade guys have done a wonderful job of increasing compute density, of increasing memory density, of increasing connectivity option density and things like that in blade form factors. But that focus on, tho on those particular factors of density really has left them few options for internal expansion options. Right? Few options to s actually stick physically a PCIe flash card in a blade server. Sure, there are some custom solutions and there are some, some things to do that, but it's, it's somewhat unnatural given the design goals of, uh, of today's blades. A networked flash device, network server flash device, is the perfect complement to those dense pack uh, blade server environments. So what it really looks like coming forward then is a hardware platform and a software stack. And you just wanna think of this in terms of, um, of, um, of some pretty big numbers, right? A two U or four U appliance, something that fits neatly into, uh, you know, into a rack and, uh, and begins to deliver very dense IOPS that goes with the dense compute and dense connectivity that are al that's already there. Um, a shareable scale out deployment model terabytes of PCIe flash and the performance that, uh, that comes with that, tens of gigabytes per second of throughput, millions of real world IOPS. These are not on a sunny day downhill with a tailwind, I might be able to achieve a certain number. These are real world IOPS measured in millions. And the types of low latency that one's come to expect from, um, from PCIe flash. Loaded latency, not best case latency, but back to that, uh, that curve I showed earlier. The software stack goes back to the design principles that we mentioned for VF cache. We care about high throughput, we care about low latency, and we care very much about high efficiency. So we're moving this to a uh, remote DMA, an RDMA stack that's been optimized for minimal impact on host CPU and on appliance CPU, and will be um, allowing Thunder to be the flash footprint for Lightning or for VF cache um, in, in, in some of these scenarios going forward. So wrapping everything up, um, today we have VF cache. We've got the performance, we've got the intelligence, we've got the protection. Um, we've talked about the intelligent IO stack from server to storage, and we've talked about um, you know, no excuses on, um, uh, on performance and no compromises on data protection and data availability. We've previewed a little bit of Project Thunder and uh, the whole notion of this network server flash, uh, how it applies to dense pack blades, how it applies to scale out uh, applications, uh, uh, clustered applications like Rack and, and some other things, uh, and how it's really aimed at the ultimate uh, in terms of performance, in terms of throughput, in terms of latency and server efficiency. And I think what we would have also tried to do here is to just take a step back and to say, as far as EMC and as far as the flash business unit is concerned, it isn't about any one particular technology. It isn't just about NAND. It isn't just about SLC or MLC. It isn't just about flash in the storage array. It isn't just about flash in the server. It isn't just hardware. It isn't just software. It's real world applications. It's real world IT ecosystems. It's real server administrators and storage administrators putting their heads together and figuring out how to get their jobs done and meet, uh, and meet business needs. And it's the ability of EMC to engage at all of those levels, whether it be solutions, services, support, uh, participative design with engineering as we're doing with, uh, with Thunder, um, consulting around uh, deployment models and application models, uh, our uh, deep partnerships with the ISV ecosystem out there and our ability to uh, engage very deeply and meaningfully with these um, uh, data management platforms that are, that are driving so many of these workloads. 
that's really what it's about, is our ability to put the whole thing together today. And um, uh, starting with VF Cache version one and going forward into this, uh, uh, the type of ecosystem that I think our customers uh, need and our customers expect from EMC. So thank you very much. All right, Dan, thank you. Uh, those of you that have questions for Dan, Dan will be around um, afterwards. What I'd like to do now is just uh, formally say thank you to everybody who is with us online. Thank you uh, for your questions. We will endeavor to answer all of those uh, over coming minutes and hours. Uh, for those of you that have attended in person today, uh, thanks very much. I hope we've given you some insight into what we're doing uh, in the realm of Flash. And I think as you've heard over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we'll be back again with more. So uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks.